All right, lesson number 22 in our series, Understanding Your Religion, Seven Major Doctrines That Explain the Christian Religion. As I said, this is lesson number 22. This is the doctrine of the kingdom, and the title of this lesson, The Kingdom of Heaven on Earth. If, um, if you were to take all of Jesus' sermons and all of His teachings, and if you were bringing those all together, and you were studying all of His teachings for a particular style or a central theme in His preaching, um, uh, especially if you were looking at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, okay, if you're looking at that, then the idea of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, this would be the central theme of his preaching. You see it here, you see it there, but if you were to bring all of it together and look for a theme, the kingdom, the idea of the kingdom, uh, Jesus uh, spoke about that uh, uh, a lot of the time. Uh, he spent a lot of uh, his preaching and teaching time talking about the coming of the kingdom, the preparation for the kingdom, the nature of the kingdom, the makeup of the kingdom. Uh, it seems uh, interesting that uh, Matthew used the term kingdom of heaven because you remember he, Matthew is, you know, he's writing principally for the Jews and the Jews had been trained to think in terms of heaven as a spiritual dimension. So many times when in Matthew, you know, the, Matthew you know, refers to this, uh, this theme of preaching as the kingdom of heaven, Jesus talking about the kingdom of heaven. And then if you look in Mark, Mark uses the term kingdom of God because his Gentile audience would more easily identify with this idea of a kingdom of, of a God or of a, a God because they had no concept of heaven like the Jews had a concept of heaven. Again, just using different terms to get across an idea to a different audience. Um, Jesus used the word kingdom throughout His ministry and uh, 13 of the 43 parables that He uh, spoke begin with the words, the kingdom of heaven is like. So 13 out of 43 parables talk about the kingdom. Obviously, if Jesus gave so much importance to the subject of the kingdom and our involvement in the kingdom, I think we should be familiar with the teachings about the kingdom. Uh, so this is why I've included the teaching or the doctrine of the kingdom as one of the seven major doctrines of the Bible that explain our faith. Now, we don't have time, obviously, to explore all 13 parables that describe the kingdom. You know, that's, that's a whole study, that's a whole series unto itself. Uh, and if you're interested in that, of course, uh, I, I have a series and I have a book out you know, that you know about called The Kingdom Parables. So if, you, if you'd like to study those parables, just go uh, online to BibleTalk.tv and uh, look at Kingdom Parables. You can see the videos or you can uh, download the e-book or whatever. Uh, however, we can review how the doctrine of the kingdom evolved over time, because this is a doctrine class, right? We're looking at seven major doctrines. So we're going to talk about the doctrine of the kingdom and how the doctrine of the kingdom evolved over time, because it wasn't fully formed, you know, just handed over to man. Uh, it, it, it developed over, over time. So uh, let's uh, begin in the Old Testament, shall we? Uh, ideas of the kingdom in the Old Testament. We begin with a theocratic rulership. Now in the beginning, society was designed to coexist in peace with extended families sharing the limitless resources of a perfectly balanced creation all under the loving care and the presence of God. That's Genesis. That's what was meant to be. Okay. That's, that's how it was supposed to be as we begin Genesis. There were no provisions for human rulers of any kind. The only present authority was God and His word. That, that was how the creation was originally designed to be. Now with the advent of sin, a new level of authority was instituted within the family structure, and that was that the husband was to have authority over his wife. But there was no authority in society yet. 
it, uh, it began just with the family unit. The wife was to be in submission to her husband. Uh, why? Because there was sin, and if there's sin, there's chaos, there's disorganization, and so God imposed a structure on the family. Didn't need it before, because there was no sin. Man and woman, you know, co-ruled, uh, if you wish, the world that God had created for them together. After sin, there would be a struggle for power because of sin, and so God imposed um, some uh, form of uh, authority there. Um, after the flood, if we you know, fast forward to the flood, Genesis 9, God then gives to society the authority to police itself and to execute justice for crimes, you know, a life for a life, Genesis 9, 6, in order to provide order in a new and sinful world. So He imposes order in the family, and then he imposes order, structure, if you wish, in society. For the same reason, there's sin. Because of sin, there's chaos. So the first human ruler was self-appointed. God did not appoint a human ruler. Uh, in Genesis 10, verse 10, we read about Nimrod, and Nimrod forms and reigns over his own kingdom, and was probably the main instigator in building the Tower of Babel. So this is the first instance recorded in the Bible of a human king and a human kingdom, self-appointed. Now the word king is translated from a root word in the Greek which means ruler, I mean if you're in the New Testament anyways. And the word kingdom comes from a variation of that word which refers to the geographical area over which that ruler rules. So the sinful world after the flood had gotten to the point that it had thrown off God's rule and God's presence and began to appoint for themselves rulers and kings. So with the selection of Abraham to begin forming a new people who belonged to God, there was a return to family rule with God as guide and protector. When I say a return to family rule, I mean within the line of Abraham. The world was going its own way with its own kings, self-appointed, struggling for power, warring with one another. But with the selection of Abraham, God now picks one person and begins to develop a family and then a nation, tribes, and so on and so forth. And within that stream, no king, no ruler. Still God is king. All right? God is ruler. As the nation of Israel formed from the 12 tribes descended from Jacob, we still see that contrary to pagan nations around them, the Jews still maintained the tribal leaders as the highest form of authority under the direction of God's influence and presence in their lives. So you know, throughout the Jewish history, still you know, just the leader of the tribe, leader of families, leader of tribes, no kings, no kingdom. Although they came into contact with pagan kings, the Jews remained without a king for over two centuries after they returned to the promised land from Egypt. I mean, while they were in Egypt, they were in slavery to who? Well, to a king, to a, a pagan king. But they themselves had no king. Moses was appointed as a leader, but he was not a king. He was God's servant. Okay? So up until this time, they lived under a theocratic rulership. Theocratic, theo God. God ruled the nation through his prophets, through his judges, through his appointed people. All right, so then we have human kings that come along in this history. History of the Jews, remember, history of the Jews runs parallel to the history in the world, but the Bible is really concerned about what's going on with the Jews. So once they're settled in the promised land, while still carrying on military campaigns against you know, their border enemies, a movement begins among the Jews to have a person serve as a king over the people of Israel. And this, of course, we know when we study the Old Testament, this was against God's will, but He nevertheless permitted the people to change uh, this change in their system, but He warned them what would happen. He tells them through Samuel, okay, you want a king? Boy, this is what's going to happen when you get a king. They're going to want your, your best, they're going to take your money, your land, they're going to take your children you know, as servants and soldiers, blah, blah, blah. He warns them, this is what the king's going to do. 
And what did the people say? We don't care, we want a king. We, li we like the pomp and circumstance of the kings you know, and the power they exude you know, of the pagan tribes around us. We want to be like that. We, we, still want, we still want a king. So the Bible records the sad experience that the Jews had with earthly kings, beginning with the first, of course, Saul. So Saul, very quickly now, we're not going to read all the passages, I think we're pretty familiar in this class with these stories. So Saul, what happens to Saul, the first king? Well, he goes mad and he dies in disgrace. Kills himself, in battle actually, he's wounded but he kills himself because he doesn't want the enemy to you know, desecrate his body. Then there's David, a great king, but he did disobey God, terrible sins, murder, adultery, cover-ups. And then you have Solomon, built the temple, but because he was unfaithful, he led, he led the nation into idolatry. You know, as much as we look at Solomon for wisdom and so on and so forth, realize that he was the one that led the people into, into idolatry with his example, foreign wives, and then he gave in to their desires to have foreign gods and so on and so forth. And then after Solomon, of course, what happens? Well, the kingdom is divided into north and south after his death, and then you know, there's never-ending battles between north and south, and then at, at some point the northern kingdom totally destroyed. Why? For idolatry, for having one evil king after another. And then years later the southern kingdom is also destroyed and carried off into exile for the same reason, but it's allowed to return with a remnant to Jerusalem and rebuild after 70 years. So by the time Jesus comes along there's only a very small remnant left of the original 12 tribes. Tribe of Judah, right? tribe of Benjamin. So only a small portion of the southern kingdom remains under the rulership of Rome. They're not even ruling themselves by the time Jesus comes along. They're under the rulership of Rome when Jesus comes along. Uh, let's look at uh, God's relationship with human kings. Uh, the idea that God is a king or has a kingdom is not apparent in the early portions of the Bible. You, you're, very hard, you're hard put to find that in the early parts of the Bible. The image of God's relationship and position with earthly kings and His own stature as a king as well as this entire idea of a spiritual kingdom, it's developed very slowly by different writers in the Old Testament. You know, many times God is not able to reveal a concept that people have no way of relating to or understanding. Uh, and when he uh, develops an idea slowly over time, there's a, there's a term for that, it's called progressive revelation. So in, 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 in different generations, God is revealing progressively His will or the image or an idea from one generation to another until it's kind of fully formed. Because a human being can't take, you know, he can't take in what he can't take in, right? So, where God, as I say, slowly reveals a concept one piece at a time over many years through different writers. Well, the idea of God is a king and has a kingdom, this is one of those ideas that was revealed slowly to mankind, slowly to the Jews. Now we know that human kings were subject to God. We know that they feared Him. Story in Genesis 20 verses 1 to 7, right? Abimelech, king of Shur, he feared God's wrath, why? Because he unknowingly took Abraham's wife to be his own and he took her into his harem, you know, thinking she was his sister. She was beautiful, so on and so forth. In those days, what the king wants, the king gets. He took her in and, and what does he do? He rebukes Abraham, he says, well, what have you done to me? What if I would have you know, slept with your wife? God would have you know, punished us. You know? And he was angry at Abraham for his deception because Abraham's deception would have caused him to sin. So obviously, you know, there was some knowledge of God and knowledge of God's will at that time. We see that, that little, just that little story right there. We also see, for example, the Pharaoh resist God's judgment and finally give in when God destroys the firstborn of Egypt prior to the Jews being released from captivity. However, the direct relationship between God and a king really begins with Saul, the very first king of Israel. And you know, an interesting idea about Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh thought he was the son of God. You know. And uh, 
part of his stubbornness was, who's this Moses? I'm the sun king. Okay, we'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so um, a direct relationship between God and a king in the Bible concerning the Jewish people, that begins with Saul. We see that God chooses and establishes kings. We learn that. 1 Samuel 8, 5 to 7 says that although God permits it, He recognizes that the people have chosen a human king instead of remaining with him as their king. And so uh, it goes from a theocracy to a human king leading. Uh, and this is the first hint of God as king and later on there'll be a mention uh, that he has a kingdom as well. But with Saul we just, we get an idea all right, through Samuel's writing that God sees himself as a king. So you don't want me as king, he says to, the, to Samuel, he says to the people, all right, you want your own king? So right away the thought is, wait, if God is a king? He's the king? Okay, that's, that's the idea. So it has taken a long time before the ideas that God is a king and He has His kingdom, a long time before these ideas are introduced into the Jewish mindset. It begins with the appointment of Saul the king. All right, so let's take a look at man as divine king, that idea. So on another parallel, there existed the idea that a human could be a divine ruler of sorts. As I say, the Egyptians may have been the first to combine the idea that the king was a descendant or a product of the gods and therefore divine. As I mentioned before, sun king. The Pharaoh was the sun king, descendant of the king. And as I say, it may have been why Pharaoh was so stubborn seeing Moses as an equal descendant of the gods. And the Pharaoh seeing Moses as simply a rival to his position, a rival that needed to be defeated. You know, you, you, you know, at the beginning when Moses does certain miracles, certain signs, and Pharaoh brings out his people, magicians, and they, they do the same signs, there was, an, there was a competition going on to say, who's, who's going to be the king? Who's, you know, who's the real king here? Who's the real sun god? Um, later on, the Greeks, revive this idea of the sun king, not necessarily the sun king, but that man is a descendant of God and, and, a, and a divine king on earth. The Greeks revived this idea for Western civilization with Alexander the Great, and then later on the Romans took it over. Augustus Caesar, for example, 63 BC to 14 AD, he saw his role and his person as an incarnation of the gods and thus began emperor worship. So people are, are saying, oh, emperor worship, that was like a new thing. No, no, that was an old thing. That was a thing that was borrowed way, you know, it went from one civilization to another in different formats, and by the time it reached the Romans, you know, uh, emperor worship, but you know, em the emperor was a descendant in some way of the divine. Of course, when Christians confess Jesus as Lord, the divine king, this caused the wrath of Rome and their subsequent persecution. The Romans didn't mind you know, people worshiping rocks and trees and whatever, you know. but when they started worshiping someone who was the Son of God, in a way making the same claim for Jesus that the emperor was making, okay, now we have a problem. Now there's competition. Okay? So the idea of the divine human king did not survive after Rome fell. But it continued, that's in the west, but it did continue in the east. In Japan, for example, the Shinto religion. In that religion, as it was originally developed, the Japanese people, and the, actually the actual island of Japan, came from the heavens. It was a divine place, and the people were you know, had an element of divinity, and the emperor, you know, he was a descendant of God. He was worshiped in that, in that way. One of the reasons why in the Second World War they were so fanatic about, they couldn't lose, impossible. Are you kidding? We're the descendants of God. Our place is a divine place. Our emperor is a God. And one of the interesting features of the surrender agreement that was signed after the war was over 
uh, the Japanese had to eliminate that, uh, that element in their religion, religious teaching was, that was part of the surrender agreement. They were going to take that element out of their religious teaching. And if you look back, you see the, you ever see old, some old World War II movies when they're showing the Japanese flag, it's, it's a sun, but it radiates. It's got you know, rays that go around. Well, that meant that Japan's in the center and its rays, its influence goes everywhere. It's the center of the universe and its power extends all around. Well, take a look at the Japanese flag now and what do you have? You have the red ball, the red you know, ball in the middle, no more rays. It's just on a white backdrop. That was also part of the surrender agreement. They had to change the notion of their, uh, of their religion. Now, <clears throat> the idea of the divine human king, as I say, did not survive other than in the East. Now, in the Jewish world, we see the idea of God ruling as a divine king in heavenly places. So as we move on through the history of the Jews, we get to the time of David, David describes God in this role in Psalm 47 and Psalm 101. David, through the inspiration of the Spirit, begins to describe God as a king. Uh, the earliest direct reference to the title king being used for God, however, is in the eighth century. It's by Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah chapter six, let's read that one. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings, with two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, woe is me for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. So here Isaiah, what's he describing? He's describing a king, right? I saw the king on a throne and his robe you know, was Long, you know, the, in, in, in those days the kings had these long, the longer the train, the more glorious the king. That's the, ho the whole idea of the wedding dress with the train in the back, you know, the, the woman is a queen for the day and she has a long train. That's where that concept comes from. The longer the train, the more glorious the king. Well, he says here that God's, the train of his robe, it fills the temple. How powerful is that? and the angels are praising Him, you know, holy, holy. So here's a description of a heavenly king. There's no earthly king that could fulfill this description. Isaiah, in the spirit, is describing a vision of heaven. And for the first time, a vision that sees God as a king, where people can, you know, people can relate to a king on a throne with a robe, you know, and, and others praising, yeah, they, that's like earthly kings, except this is much more spectacular. So by this time, in, in the Jewish mind, the idea that God is the king who rules over all kings is firmly fixed. So from Abraham to Isaiah, 1200 years. <laughs> Progressive revelation. So from this point, excuse me, uh, from this point to the idea of the divine king taking on a human form and dwelling among men and inviting them into his divine kingdom, this will be processed by several other prophets over another eight centuries. So it took 12 centuries to establish the idea that God is a king on His throne, He's the king of kings. Then the idea that, that God the king comes to earth in human form, establishes a kingdom here, invites people into His kingdom here another eight centuries before we, before we get there. All right, so the king and his kingdom now in the New Testament. After Isaiah, the prophets Zechariah and Obadiah begin to describe the Messiah as a charismatic ruler or king who would appear and renew the golden period of Jewish history. Golden period of Jewish history is the period of Solomon. Extended the borders of the kingdom at peace, wealthy, fabulously wealthy and powerful. Um, Zechariah, Obadiah, 
they're the ones that develop this idea, not just that God is the king, but the Messiah who is coming is going to be like a king. Uh, he would purify the nation, he would save it from its enemies, he would have sovereignty over all the nations. So it was this kind of prophecy that stirred the hopes of the nation for a redeemer and a savior to come in the future. These prophets filled out the description of the one to come spoken of before, but not well pictured. So Daniel, of course, picks up and develops this image even further in Daniel 7 by giving an exact historical time when this person would come. So in Daniel 7, Daniel describes the rise and fall of four world kingdoms and then the establishment of a fifth kingdom. Daniel, however, adds two important ideas to the ones already mentioned. So Daniel talks about the, you know, the four earthly kingdoms, you know, the Babylonians, the Mesopotamians, you know, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans. You know, he talks about those four with the statue and everything. And then he says a fifth kingdom will come. You know, a stone will come and you know, hit the statue on the, on the foot or on the toe and the statue will crumble and then the stone will grow up into a mountain that'll cover the earth. You know, that stone, that's the fifth kingdom. That's the kingdom of God. The importance of Daniel is that he situates all these ideas about the, the Messiah and the coming, he situates it in history. He, he's, he's the prophet that says, yeah, all this stuff is going to happen and let me tell you when it's going to happen. After these four kingdoms appear, the fifth will appear and that's when, you know, that's when the Messiah is going to come. But uh, in addition to that, he adds two other important ideas. One, the Messiah is a divine king, not just a human ruler. And two, he will rule not only by himself, but he will rule with his people who will constitute a divine kingdom. So Daniel is brings the idea, not just a king, but a king in his kingdom, and people will be the kingdom. So the concept of the Messiah as divine king ushering in a special kingdom to rule over all other kingdoms was finally expressed in its fullness by Daniel. So this set the stage for the last two prophets to speak about the kingdom of God. First one is John the Baptist. So when John comes along, the people are anticipating a king who will purify and save and exalt the Jewish nation over its enemies. John's initial preaching falls into line with their expectations. What does John say? Repent and be baptized to ready yourselves and be ready for the, king, for the kingdom because the kingdom is coming. And the people, how did they respond? Well, they understood that message. They knew the prophets. They knew Daniel. They said, OK, now's the time. And he says, all right, you get ready for the time. The kingdom is coming. People were being baptized. John also announced the divine aspect of the kingdom by speaking of the Holy Spirit and how the one to come would baptize people with the Holy Spirit. Not just any king, a king who would give you the spirit. So a spiritual kingdom. Now one idea that had not yet been developed and caused some confusion for John and the people concerning the kingdom was they thought that the king and the kingdom were like two different things and they believed that there would be a great political change when he came. That was, the, that was the confusion among the people. OK, the king is going to come and things are going to change. You know, we're going to get rid of Rome. Uh, we're going to be the boss of ourselves. We're going to constitute a kingdom. You see, that was the confusion. That's why they, when Jesus came along, they're saying, this is the king. This is the Messiah. He's from Nazareth. We know his parents. You know. And, and who are his followers? Well, a bunch of fishermen, you know, uneducated, poor, coming from the same hick town up north. You know, that they, they weren't getting it at all. So you see what I'm saying? Even though he personally did the miracles, and they were going, yeah, okay, divine king, I'm, I'm with you to there. You know? But they didn't see the result. They were thinking that he would change things, earthly things didn't understand the idea of the divine kingdom. All right, so let's look, and then the last prophet, if you wish, Jesus, he's a prophet, Jesus the Messiah. So when Jesus finally arrives, 
he follows John's preaching about the kingdom, but he tells them that the kingdom now, it's arrived, it's here, it's among you, it's right next to you, it's in the middle of you. Of course, he's talking about himself, right? The deduction is that if the kingdom has arrived, well then the kingdom, the Messiah, he's arrived too. At first, with his miracles and teachings, the people want to see him as the king to come, yes. But when the political changes don't happen, they begin to re reject him and they're confused. They're confused, they're saying, well, we see him doing all these fantastic things, but he must be the devil. They've got to find an answer to how, how does he do these spectacular things? You know, well, he must be the devil. So Jesus is the one who develops fully the concept of the kingdom only partially described throughout history by the different prophets. So he clarifies, okay? He explains that the divine king is at the center of the kingdom, not like human kings who are at the top of the kingdom. Human kings are at the top, everybody else is at the bottom. Jesus says, in the kingdom of God, the king is at the center and the people are around him. Secondly, he explains that the kingdom is not earthly, political, it's spiritual in nature. Clarification that people really had a problem with. He also tells them that the kingdom is made up of the king and those who are united to him by faith, not culture. Doesn't matter what culture you are, doesn't matter what class you belong to. You belong to him, you become part of the kingdom through faith in him. He also explains that the kingdom has a past, a present, and the future. The past, well, the kingdom was prophesied and it was hoped for. The present, Jesus manifests its king and provides an earthly dimension for the kingdom, which is the church. And the future, at the end of the world, all aspects of the kingdom, earthly and heavenly, will merge into one single unit. Okay, let me make a, a little you know, parenthetical statement here. This is where, you know the 13 parables I'm talking about, you know, the king is king, the 13 parables about the kingdom, this is where the 13 parables fit in. Through the parables, Jesus described the nature and the tension between the present condition of the kingdom and the future consummation when Jesus returns the second time. That's what the parables are about. He, he explained, this is, the kingdom of heaven is like, and he kept describing what the kingdom was like, a pearl, a treasure, okay? Um, and he tried to explain the difference between, um, not the difference between, the, but the tension between the existence in the kingdom of God now, as you live in an earthly you know, uh, environment, and how the kingdom will be when he returns, when the earth and the heaven and earth are, are, are done away with, a new heaven and earth is created by God to, to do what? To permit human beings in a glorified state to exist with God forever. Remember I think I mentioned to you before, no one can be in the presence of God. God has to create a special dimension where he can dwell with us because we can't be with Him where He is. No one can. That's why you know, it says, the Bible says, uh, there'll be a new heaven and new earth. Why is a new heaven and new earth necessary? Well, a special dimension is necessary to enable us to exist with God forever. Okay? So the parables of the kingdom try to explain these ideas. How does someone who belongs to the kingdom a spiritual dimension, how does that person live here in the physical dimension? That's why things are so upside down. You know, uh, 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 you know in the, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, you know, uh, 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 blessed are those who are persecuted for my name. Well, that's completely upside down. If you're, if you're persecuted, you don't, you don't usually are happy about that thing. But if you're in the kingdom, right, and you're persecuted because of it, it does bring a certain amount of joy. Why? Because I must be doing something right because people are persecuting me because of Jesus. So they're, they're, they're seeing who I am, recognizing who I am. Okay, uh, so let's do one more thing. The kingdom theology now in post New Testament, so we started way back at Genesis, the idea of the kingdom, and I've kind of walked you through history. Okay, so now post New Testament, after the New Testament, 
What are some of the ideas of the kingdom? So a lot of what people think about the kingdom of God today is based on various theological ideas, doctrinal ideas that were developed after the New Testament was written. For example, uh, Roman Catholic theology and doctrine. The Catholics think or th thought um, that was formed by Augustine mainly, in the, he was a, a monk in fourth century, Catholics believed that what the kingdom and the church, they're exactly the same thing. They saw the kingdom as a spiritual monarchy where the pope was ordained as head of the church and the church was ruled as a kingdom with lesser officials ruling in different parts. So the point I'm making is that if you ask, why do they do that? Why, why does the pope dress like that? And they, they, you know, he lives like a king. And the cardinals are, are like dukes. And you know, why is it, how did it get to be like that? Well, it got to be like that because of the doctrine of the kingdom that they espouse. The kingdom of God on earth is a monarchy. And the pope is the representative of the king. He's the king on earth. And so a, an earthly kingdom, how does it work? Top down. Well, Roman Catholic Church is totally top down, right? The Pope, the Cardinals, the Archbishops, the Bishops, the Priests, the Brothers, the Nuns, you know, it's top down. And it's top down because of its concept, its idea, its thinking about the kingdom of God. I mean, I, we don't have time to go deep into that, but I just want to show you why is this doctrine important? Well, <laughs> it affects the way you see yourself as a Christian. Uh, Protestants, uh, the reformers, uh, the reformers emphasized the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. Like in Luke chapter 17 verse 20, Jesus says the kingdom is coming with signs not to be observed. So for Protestants the kingdom uh, was not manifested in strict hierarchy like, like the Catholics thought, but rather through the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, among believers. And so among Protestants, transformation of lives was the sign of the believers. And we see that charismatics, for example, carry this idea to the extreme. You know, in charismatic churches, you, you know you're part of the kingdom if you're able to speak tongues and you know, prophecy and so on and so forth. And so Protestant theology you know, bordered or focused the kingdom on the idea of the work of the Holy Spirit, what kind of work is the Holy Spirit doing in a person's life. Uh, in modern theology, modernists, um, the social gospel started maybe in the 50s and 60s, mostly prevalent in South America. The social gospel proponents see the kingdom as God's presence in men making the world a better place. So the kingdom of God is here to make this world a better place. That's the modern theology, and you know what? Pope Francis, the current pope, um, is very familiar with this teaching because most of his teaching is about the poor and the environment and the evils of capitalism and so on and so forth. So he is very much a believer of this image of the kingdom whose role is to make this world a better place. That's why he's such a radical among Catholics. Among Catholics, he eschews you know, the papal dress and you know, less king, more social worker. The so why? Well, because the idea of the social gospel found its footing in South America. And where's he from? Oh, South America. He's been influenced by that doctrinal position. And so he's trying to marry both of them together. That's why he just wears a white tunic, you know, he kisses babies, a man of the people, he touches them, you know, he wades into the crowd. I'm a man of the people, yeah, social gospel. Let, let's help the poor, let's clean up the environment. In other words, let's clean up this world. Not a bad thing, not exactly what Jesus taught about the kingdom. Of course, the task of Christians is to understand and experience the kingdom as Jesus saw and explained it. So I believe a more accurate biblical view of the kingdom teaches the following things. It teaches that Jesus Christ is at the center. 
that the, king begins with, the kingdom begins with Jesus at the center. Number two, that the church is the expression of the kingdom in the image of Christ here in the physical world. And that presence on earth is explained in the parables and in the Sermon on the Mount. Number three, the complete fullness achieved is going to be achieved when Jesus returns to glorify the church, His kingdom. And how would that be in conflict with other things? Well, we believe that the kingdom is not here to make the world a better place. That's not the end goal. We believe the end goal is to call people into the kingdom and to make a witness for the kingdom by doing these other good works. There's nothing wrong with taking care of the environment and the poor and so on, of course. But that's not our objective. That's our witness. We know there's no fix in this world. We know the poor will always be here. We're not here to end poverty because Jesus said the poor will always be here till the end of time. There'll be poor people. Till the end of time there'll be wars and rumors of wars. There'll be disasters and floods. Till the end of time there's nothing to fix that. Whatever we do to help human misery, we do it as a witness for the kingdom. Okay? And then fourth, fully integrate, the, the kingdom will be fully integrated when God and Christ and the Spirit and the church and the angels and the spiritual world will all be united into one unit forever. The new heavens and the new earth, that's where the kingdom will finally be complete. So the study of the kingdom involves understanding the difference between where we are and how we function now in the present state of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God here on earth and where and how we will be when the kingdom is fully realized in the future and that's when Jesus returns. And that's why we study the Sermon on the Mount, it's why we study the parables about the kingdom because that's where the information is about that tension. All right, so this study here leads us to the last of the seven major doctrines and that is the doctrine of the second coming of Jesus. That's the seventh major doctrine. So the doctrine of the kingdom leads us there because we're saying, well, the fulfillment of the kingdom is when Jesus comes. So our, the last doctrine that we're going to study is, when does Jesus come? And what will happen when He comes? Okay, and that'll be the last two lessons. We're going to look at it from what Jesus said about His coming and what Paul said about His coming. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.